Le coup le plus rusé que le diable ait jamais réussi, ça a été de faire croire à tout le monde qu'il n'existait pas. Welcome to our webinar brought to you by Defeat HIV Community Advisory Board. Today we're going to be talking with Dr. Jennifer Adair about gene therapy in a box. So this webinar is brought to you by the Community Advisory Board of Defeat HIV, housed at the Fred Hodgson Cancer Research Center in Seattle as part of the, one of the Martin Delaney collaboratories. Uh, I am your moderator for this webinar today, Eric Sielbeck. I am the uh, Regional Resource Consultant for uh, U.S. Health and Human Services Region 10 Regional Health Administrator's Office, based here in Seattle, also a member of the PHAB CHAP. A couple of housekeeping items for you today. If you could please mute your line during the webinar uh, so that we can reduce background noise. Uh, make sure if you have a question uh, that you can, you can raise your hand uh, by pressing the hand button next to your name or you can uh, type your question into the chat. We'll be paying attention to that. If your line is muted, uh, we will ask you to unmute it when we call your name for your question. Uh, so those things I just said. Remember, this webinar is being recorded. We'll post it in a couple different places. One will be the Defeat HIV website at www.defeathiv.org, uh, or also on the Defeat HIV YouTube channel. You can search on YouTube for Defeat HIV, or you can find the link to it from our website. Uh, also, we have a couple other um, social media presences. You can find us on Facebook and like us. You can find us on Twitter and follow us there, retreat, retweet us, all that fun stuff uh, on the web or on your phones because we all know you have smartphones. So we're very excited and honored to have Dr. Jennifer Adair with us today. Uh, she is an assistant member in the Clinical Research Division and Program for Stem Cell and Gene Therapy at Fred Hutch. She's also a research assistant professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Her research in collaboration with Defeat HIV lead researcher Hans Peter Kiem is about translating anti-HIV gene therapy in combination with drug resistance gene therapy for the treatment of AIDS lymphoma. The lessons learned from these studies provide directives to overcome remaining barriers to mainstream clinical application of hemato hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy for HIV and other diseases. Uh, we're very excited to have her here. and I'm going to turn the webinar over to her. Thank you very much. Take it away. Thanks for that uh, great introduction, Eric. It's to be here today uh, and to talk to you about uh, our research trying to make gene therapy and specifically uh, blood stem cell gene therapy to treat HIV uh, something that is both portable and scalable. So if I can leave you with one uh, particular thought um, after you see this webinar, uh, it's just that making gene-modified blood cells in a box is, in fact, possible. Uh, and I hope that the data I'm about to show you will convince you that this is actually true. But I wanted to first um, talk about the current state of gene therapy in general. Um, more than 2,000 patients worldwide have been treated with some form of gene therapy to date. Um, and specifically in terms of blood cell gene therapy, I'm listing here uh, diseases that have been successfully treated and documented um, with gene therapy uh, and had treatment benefit. Um, these are either T cells or blood stem cells typically. Uh, the majority of these di diseases are confined to smaller patient populations for the most part with the exception of the, the thalassemias. Um, but as we demonstrate success in these diseases, the field is starting to turn its gaze toward uh, 
diseases that have greater patient distributions, including HIV and sickle cell disease. And as I'll highlight in just a couple of slides when we start talking about targeting uh, gene therapy toward diseases that have a large global distribution, uh, we really need to think about how we're reasonably going to scale and deliver these therapies to the patients that need them. Um, but really, what gives us uh, any evidence to suggest that gene therapy is a good target uh, treatment for HIV. And I'm sure to many in this group, uh, the man on the screen requires not much introduction. Uh, Timothy Ray Brown is also known as the Berlin patient. He's the only known individual cured of HIV to date. Uh, and the treatment that he received that led to his functional cure uh, was pretty complex. Timothy developed AIDS-related leukemia, or cancer in the white blood cells. Uh, and required a lot of treatments uh, that eventually led to his current uh, health status. And I'm going to pick apart sort of the three things in the field that are thought to have led to the cure that was achieved in Timothy Ray Brown, and then I'll talk about how uh, we're using gene therapy to systematically deduce whether some or all of those components uh, could contribute to a gene therapy-based cure for many, many more patients. So the first piece of this puzzle was that Timothy received a, what I call fully loaded bone marrow transplant, and he actually received two of these. And the main take home here is that that particular treatment involved what we call myeloablative conditioning, or intensive treatment to essentially wipe out all of his existing blood cells and blood cell production. Um, this not only got rid of many of the HIV-infected cells in his blood, but it also created a lot of space for uh, new cells to take over blood cell production, and specifically in his case from the donor. Now, the donor uh, in the second transplant that he received happened to also carry a mutation in a gene called CCR5. And this is a gene we call a co-receptor for HIV entry. Um, it's a small protein expressed on the surface of T cells and, and some other cells that HIV will use to um, infect cells. And when CCR5 is not expressed on the surface of cells, such as in the donor of Timothy's second bone marrow transplant, um, HIV is um, not able to infect those cells, so the cells are actually resistant to HIV infection. Now, because Timothy received myeloablative conditioning, these donor cells were able to go in and actually form new blood cells, including T cells, uh, that were HIV resistant. And then the third thing, or third component of this treatment was that these HIV-resistant T cells uh, in the, from the donor actually recognized all cells that were Timothy's as foreign and mounted a pretty significant immune response. This is uh, something we refer to as graft-versus-host disease. Uh, and this is important, too, because it's possible that this, um, these T cells from the donor then went out and sort of recognized any residual HIV-infected cells that were Timothy and eradicated them. Now, in gene therapy, we're typically talking about using a patient's own cells, so we can't really get at this graft versus host disease component, but we can systematically evaluate both the conditioning piece and the HIV-resistant blood cell piece. So we currently have two clinical trials enrolling patients uh, with AIDS-related leukemia to get at the conditioning piece, and we're targeting this patient population because it would be appropriate to treat them with things like chemotherapy that are used in conditioning. The first of these trials is treating patients who have just been diagnosed who are receiving their first-line treatment of chemotherapy, which acts as a mild conditioning, so not a fully loaded, but it's going to create some space for cells to go in and engraft and produce new blood cells. The second trial is actually going to take patients who have the same diagnosis but have already failed that um, first-line treatment. Their, their cancer has come back, and so basically they would be candidates for transplants, and they are going to require a fully loaded conditioning regimen. And this will allow us to compare whether mild conditioning or fully loaded conditioning is more beneficial um, to the gene therapy treatment. And we don't know in any of these cases if we'll be able to achieve enough um, gene-modified cells or HIV-resistant cells in these patients. So we've included in these um, trials a gene that's resistant to chemotherapy. So if these patients go on to receive more chemotherapy after their gene therapy treatment, the gene-modified cells are, protect are protected from that chemotherapy. Um, and so it would be a way for us to increase the number of gene-modified cells if two low levels are observed after their treatment. <laughs> 
Now to render these cells HIV resistant, we're actually using a, a dual strategy. So as I mentioned, Timothy Stoner had a naturally occur occurring mutation in CCR5 that prevented it from being on the cell surface. Uh, we've actually introduced a mechanism that doesn't require you to have that mutation, but will basically degrade any CCR5 in your cells before it has a chance to get to the cell surface to mimic um, what had happened there, but is uh, basically viable in many different patients' genetic backgrounds. But uh, one of the elegant things about the HIV virus is that when it can't find CCR5, it will sometimes try to find other receptors that it can use. Uh, one, another one is called CXCR4. Um, and so we also introduced a small protein called a C-peptide. Um, this is actually a mimic of a piece of the, the um, HIV um, viral envelope that attaches to the cell surface. And this actually prevents the cell from taking up HIV regardless of which, express, um, which co-receptors are expressed. So it's really kind of a double whammy to prevent HIV resistance in these patients. Now this is obviously complicated and it's involving a lot of clinical trials to get at. So why do we think that this is reasonable? Well, in the simplest terms, uh, Shackman and colleagues in 2006, which a decade ago, I'm sure the numbers have gone up since then, published that the lifetime cost of care estimate for HIV treatment in the United States was $600,000 per patient just for combination antiretroviral therapy. Currently, our blood stem cell gene therapy trials cost for a single treatment um, at or below about $150,000. So we think that there is a cost-to-benefit ratio for developing a gene therapy-based HIV treatment and or cure. So let's assume that we do come up with something that's really viable in the gene therapy realm. Now, those trials that I just showed you are not the only trials going on in the U.S. They just happen to be the trials that are happening here in Seattle. Um, there are multiple centers, as I'll show you on the next slide, that are also conducting other anti-HIV gene therapy trials targeting T cells as well as blood stem cells. Um, but when we look at the global distribution of this particular disease as shown here, with dark blue representing the countries that have the highest um, reported prevalence of HIV-infected individuals. And we overlay with this the countries that have active gene therapy uh, clinical centers. You can see that distribution is going to be a major issue to the patient populations who need these treatments. And if you think that this is limited to a global scale, I'll show you on the next slide just in the United States alone. Uh, the States and cities with centers that have active gene therapy trials um, are illustrated by a dot. If that dot is blue, it's got uh, an active HIV gene therapy trial. If that dot is green, it's looking at blood stem cell gene therapy, uh, but not necessarily having any open clinical trials for HIV. And so domestic distribution will be something that we'll accomplish most likely first, and then uh, we'll plan to um, try to extend that to a more global distribution pattern. So why is this limited to so few countries and so few centers? Uh, and primarily this is because the current state of the art to produce gene-modified blood cell therapies is very complicated. Um, so traditionally you have the patient shown here on the left um, who is undergoing their treatment uh, in the clinic, in this case an apheresis process to collect white blood cells. Those cells then have to be transferred to a lab where they're manually prepared uh, to have the stem cells and or T cells isolated from that product. Um, that is done using a, a set of markers. So if we're looking for a stem cell, we would use something called CD34. If we're looking for a T cell, we could use something called CD3, CD4, or CD8. Don't forget to mute your lines, please, so we can limit background noise. Thank you. Uh, and what I'm showing here is the first generation device that we use to separate out these cells from the rest of the white blood cell product. Once we have those cells, they then have to be transferred into a clean room uh, facility, and they're further manipulated by hand. Here they're exposed to the reagents that we use to accomplish the transfer of therapeutic genes. They're cultured under conditions that simulate the human body. But basically, this is uh, very much done by hand by individuals who are highly trained. Now, because the cells have been outside of the patient's body, have been exposed to the air, have been manipulated in many different ways, um, the potential that they've been exposed to infectious agents has increased. So they have to undergo a pretty stringent testing process 
to make sure that they are suitable to go back into a patient, especially if that patient was previously treated with chemotherapy uh, to basically knock out some of their immune system. And after all of that, then the cells go back to the clinic uh, where the patient is located uh, to be reinfused. And all of this needs to be done under what the FDA deems current good manufacturing practice or GMP infrastructure, which to develop the clean rooms and testing facilities is a multi-million dollar endeavor. So to do this with stem cells currently takes somewhere between two and a half and four days. Uh, to do this with T cells in current clinical trials takes about five to 14 days. And we can imagine that if all of this could be condensed into a black box, that was in a small footprint and prevented exposure to the ambient air, that this could be something that would be much more highly portable, scalable, and affordable in terms of not just gene therapy for HIV, but for many other of the diseases that I showed on that first slide. So we started thinking uh, many years ago, actually, about what this block, black box would need to have in order to be able to do this process. And I'm listing here just the six general um, characteristics that the system would need to have to be able to accomplish this entire process. Um, and I'll importantly point out the closed system component, so you want it to be not exposed to the ambient air so that essentially it would feed directly from the patient's bag in the clinic onto the device and then would produce a bag that could be hung back on the patient's IV line for infusion without ever exposing it to ambient air. Um, until a few years ago, this technology wasn't available, but then about two and a half years ago, a company called Milteni Biotech, who actually manufactures the first generation cell separation device uh, shown previously, uh, released a device called the Clinimax Prodigy. And this device was meant to just automate steps one and two of the process, of the six step process I showed you earlier. But when we looked at the core components of this particular piece of technology, we noted that it had all of those six features that are listed underneath that we in an ideal world would like for our black box to have. What it didn't have was the capability uh, or the software infrastructure to actually do all of those things, um, as well as some of the hardware pieces that we needed um, to actually make it do the entire process from start to finish. But we hypothesized that using this base technology, we could actually extend it beyond just automating steps one and two to produce an entire gene-modified blood cell product from a patient product in a box on a bench top. So I'm showing you here, here in the photo the device that we currently have at Fred Hutch. It's now one of two devices that are available. The first thing we had to do was develop the software which could redirect the device for this gene transfer process. Um, so we worked to do that to develop uh, program modules that were capable of making things move on the device where we needed them to do in the appropriate order and the appropriate time frame to regulate temperatures and gas influxes um, the way that we needed them to to develop this process. And then we also had to develop some disposables in collaboration with Milteni Biotech for single patient use um, to really make this feasible. Once we had these things, we knew that there would sort of be four key components that we would have to be able to demonstrate. The first was that we could isolate hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, or the CD34 positive cells, I'm gonna call HSPC uh, for the rest of the talk. And we, we started with this cell fraction because it's the focus of our gene therapy trials here in Seattle. But all of the things I'm going to show you would be amenable to T cell, uh, gene modified T cell products as well. Uh, we also had to be able to show that we could efficiently transfer these genes into the HSPC that we isolated. We had to show that anything we produced in this platform was safe for patient infusion. And we had to show that these HSPC would be functional if we were to put them back into a patient. So the first proof of concept uh, we started with was to take healthy adults and to collect a, a, what we call mobilized apheresis product. So in this case, the stem cells typically will reside in your bone marrow, but we wanted to make this um, less invasive. So uh, the standard clinical process for collecting stem cells from a person would be to give them a growth factor injection once a day uh, for five days, and then on the fifth day to hook them up to an apheresis machine, which will take a unit of blood, spin it down, collect the white blood cell fraction where the stem cells are, and return the rest of the blood product back to the patient. This gets rid of a lot of the unwanted cells like red blood cells up front, 
uh, so that they don't um, influence the process. And this is also the most common blood product that is used in gene therapy trials currently. So once we had these products, we put them onto the device. Our programming takes the products initially, does um, the introductory preparation of these cells for cell separation, and then it actually uses a magnet to pull the stem cells out of the blood cell pool. And it does this by taking an antibody that detects CD34 that is attached to a metal bead and incubating it with the cells. Any stem cells or HSPC will pick up the antibody if they express CD34 and will also pick up the metal bead. Then we activate a magnet, which essentially makes all of those cells stick, um, while the rest of the cells that we don't want pass through. Um, we then transfer the cells to the chamber highlighted on the device here. Um, we can regulate gas, uh, specifically 5% carbon dioxide is a mimic of the, the human body condition as well as 37 degrees Celsius. And we expose the cells to the same gene transfer reagents that we're currently using in our clinical trial. In this case, it's a lentiviral vector that encodes those three therapeutic genes, the CCR5 knockdown gene, the C-peptide, and our chemotherapy resistance gene. We then cultured the cells and then uh, prepared them for infusion by washing them to get rid of all of the viral reagents, um, the culture reagents, and then putting them into a formulation that would be safe for patient infusion. This is essentially like a saline solution that contains a pharmaceutical grade human serum albumin. Now, we tested these to make sure that they met our criteria for infusion, but to test their functionality um, in a biological system, we couldn't put them back into the patients that we got them from, one, because those patients were healthy, and two, because we don't have FDA approval yet for the device. So as an alternative model, we actually used a, an immunodeficient mouse a model called a xenotransplantation. These mice don't have uh, an immune system, so um, these cells can be accepted and can go into the bone marrow and graft and produce blood cells, and we can track that over a period of time. Um, to do this entire process required us to build about five custom uh, software programs and to manipulate two different tubing sets. The tubing set is all of the clear lines that you see weaving in and out of this device uh, in the photograph. And then to get these cells to perform in the mouse, we also had to give the mouse uh, 2.7 gray total body irradiation to create some space for these cells to go in. But this is not fully loaded conditioning. This is what we consider mild conditioning in this particular mouse model. So the first thing, again, was whether or not we could get the stem cells out. Uh, I'm showing here for two different apheresis donors the amount of initial volume that was put in, um, as well as how many CD34 cells we were able to get out in blue. And then what we're really interested in is the percent of CD34s that we were successfully able to collect. And that's shown in the bottom line in red. Uh, for the first donor, this was a little low, probably because we were still figuring out the device and how it could work. Uh, for the second donor, we were able to get this up to about 87%. However, both of these numbers are in the range of variability that we observe with the standard process currently. We've uh, since performed this on several additional apheresis donors, which I'm not showing the data for, and we consistently can get about a 60% yield of the starting CD34 population. So this was our evidence that the stem cells could, in fact, be collected. Please hold for just one moment. We're going to mute all the lines because there's music playing from someone. Uh, and so if you have a question at some point, click the raise your hand button and we will unmute your line so that you can ask that question. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, this was demonstrating, number one, that we could, in fact, isolate the stem cells uh, from these blood cell products using our device. And then so the next question was whether or not we could uh, transfer genes into these cells. Tom, it's not advancing. There we go. So um, we did two measures of gene transfer in these cells. Um, in an in vitro capacity, meaning outside of the body. On the left, I'm showing you something called a li liquid culture analysis test. 
In this case, we took some of the stem cells that we had gene modified in our process, and we put them into culture conditions that stimulate um, blood, and we threw a bunch of growth factors at them to try and get them to make as many mature blood cells as they possibly could. And we kept these cells in liquid culture for a period of 11 days, and we took samples at two time points, at five days and 11 days, and we just asked how many cells in this culture condition contain vector, and specifically how many vector copies are present. Um, and so for the first donor, um, we saw that there were about uh, 4.8 copies at five days and then about two and a half copies at 11 days. For the second donor, we had a much higher level of gene transfer, um, about 17 copies at five days and about 10 copies um, at 11 days. Now, both of these are good measures of gene transfer. It means that we're definitely getting gene transfer. There's donor to donor variability and how well the cells take up those genes. But both of these are um, considered clinically viable levels of gene transfer for gene therapy studies. In the second donor, the levels are actually a little on the high side um, compared to what we would like to see. We'd ideally like something that was probably between two and five. Um, in the second assay, uh, we did something called a colony forming assay. And this is a little bit better measure of how much gene transfer actually occurred in cells that are going to be able to go in and produce new blood cells. Um, in this case, we assimilate the conditions in bone marrow by providing a more semi-solid uh, media and, again, growth factors. And we do this for a period of about 14 days, and individual cells that are true HSPC will form individual colonies in this matrix. If we know how many cells we plated, we can calculate how many cells in the product were capable of producing colonies, and then we can also look at the DNA of each individual colony and assess what percentage of them actually got the genes that we were trying to put in. And we do this by just looking for the lentivirus that we use to transfer the genes into these cells. So what you're seeing here on the right is the percentage of colony-forming cells that had um, the lentivirus transferred into the DNA. Um, and you can see that both of these levels were 60% or greater, which is excellent for gene therapy clinical trials. So now that we had demonstrated we could get stem cells and we could efficiently transfer the therapeutic genes into those cells in this system, we needed to show that by doing this in a bench top of a standard lab, we were not compromising the safety of these cell products for infusion. So not going to go over too many of the details except to say this is the same test list we use for our current gene therapy trial patients. So we performed all the same tests that are used in our, our current state of the art to determine the suitability of these products for infusion. The required result um, for it to be considered safe for infusion is in the second column. And you could see that both donor products that were tested met these criteria um, with flying colors. So we've now got points one through three. We got stem cells. They were efficiently gene modified. And they con are considered safe for infusion by our current clinical standard. So how did they perform in the mouse experiment? Um, we transplanted about um, 15 to 20 mice with cells from each of these donors, um, and we monitored these mice over a period of 12 weeks. And the first thing we look for is just the presence of human cells in the peripheral blood. And we do this by looking for a different cell marker, CD45. Uh, we take a small sample of blood from the mouse, and then we run it um, in an assay that tells us how many cells are expressing the human CD45 marker. Each dot represents the percent of cells in the peripheral blood of that mouse, um, indicating that all of these cells were capable of engrafting uh, and persisting in the mouse for a period of up to 12 weeks. At 12 weeks, we then took these mice and um, euthanized them and looked in their bone, blood and bone marrow for the presence of gene-modified cells, because we really, to get our therapeutic uh, potential, need to have gene-modified cells present. And you could see that every single mouse transplanted had some level of gene-modified cells in the blood or the bone marrow, that on average, um, these levels were a little bit higher. Um, in donor two, which are the blue dots, which aligns with the in vitro data we showed that that um, particular donor had a higher vector copy number. But it showed us that these cells could, in fact, go into an individual in a mild conditioning setting, set up shop in the bone marrow, and produce blood cells. So one of the caveats to this with apheresis products is that mobilizing and apheresing a patient isn't always uh, a possibility. 
Um, for example, in very, very young patients, uh, we could not mobilize and um, give growth factor and apheresis. So there we would have to do a bone marrow collection. Uh, this would also be true for any adult, uh, such as sickle cell disease patients, where mobilization from a clinical standpoint is contraindicated. So we also wanted to see if we could start with a bone marrow product um, that had been harvested in the OR and have the device do all of the same things it just did. So in this case, we took healthy adult donors uh, who uh, submitted to a bone marrow harvest. Um, in this case, we have to get rid of red blood cells first before we can do anything else. Um, and to do that, we use the same clinical procedure that's used if you were a bone marrow donor for a transplant patient. Uh, it's something called head of starch sedimentation to get rid of the red blood cells and preserve the white blood cells. So it's just one additional step in the process up front that has to happen before we can get to the stem cells. We then took that red blood cell depleted bone marrow, we isolated CD34 positive cells from it, we performed the same anti-HIV gene transfer that we did for the apheresis products, and we infused those cells into mice. This required us to make a couple more custom programs, so seven modules total. Um, it required the same tubing set setup, so still two tubing sets to accomplish everything on the device. Now, what we did see was that this additional step up front in the process got us to a relatively consistently lower number of stem cells that we were able to select out of these products. But it's still clinically viable at about um, anywhere between 42 and 57 percent of the starting CD34 positive cell population. Now, for the sake of time and to encourage questions, I'm not going to go over all of the rest of the data from bone marrow. Suffice it to say that everything else looked very similar to what we saw in apheresis products, which is not uh, surprising because the rest of the process from this point on is identical. What we really wanted to do next was very robustly challenge uh, this system and its ability to produce an autologous product, meaning a product that's going to go back into the same individual it came from, and to really do it not in the setting of mild conditioning, but in fully loaded conditioning, completely myeloablative. So if these cells can't function, essentially the recipient is not going to survive this treatment. And to do this, we chose a non-human primate model, specifically the pigtail macaque, um, we've got a lot of experience transplanting in this setting, and one of the advantages is that you can use all the same reagents that you use for human cell manufacture, the same vectors for gene transfer, the same growth factors, the same media, um, and so it's a good system for us to evaluate this in. It also allows us to collect cells from an individual and give them back to that individual after myeloablative conditioning. So we did this uh, in two different animals, and I'll show you the data on the next few slides. To just review the process here, we actually gave the, the monkeys growth factor injections every day uh, for four days. This really packs their bone marrow full of stem cells. It will move some stem cells into the peripheral blood, but it's not very easy to get a monkey to sit for apheresis, so we actually do a bone marrow harvest under anesthesia. Uh, and we call this primed bone marrow. Um, it's not the same as uh, apheresis product or a straight-up non-manipulated bone, bone marrow product. We then put this on the device and performed uh, the same red blood cell depletion that we did for the human bone marrow products, because we do still have red blood cells there that needed to be gotten rid of. Now, the one place where monkeys differ from human beings is in the ability to select out the stem cells. The same reagent, the same CD34 antibody bound to a metal bead that we would use for a person doesn't cross-react with the CD34 that's expressed on monkey blood stem cells. So here we had to have a monkey um, antibody that um, would attach, and then we had to separately attach the metal bead to that particular antibody. So it turned it from a one-step to a two-step process. Um, we then cultured these cells and performed the gene, same gene transfer, except in this case to make it really easy to see if these cells got into the monkey. Instead of expressing the anti-HIV genes, we used the exact same vector expressing a green fluorescent protein. So in our assays, anything that's gene modified will glow green and make it easy for us to pick up um, in our tests. Um, the cells that came off, we would um, basically perform similar tests to our human products, and then we would infuse these into the monkey after the monkey received what we consider a fully loaded conditioning regimen of 1020 centigrade total body irradiation. 
So if these cells are not going to reconstitute blood in this monkey, the monkey's not going to survive this process. So the first thing that we noticed is that, again, we saw a suboptimal enrichment yield of the CD34 positive cells, most likely because now we've taken um, the red blood cell depletion that lowered it a little bit in the bone marrow, and now we've added a two-step process to the labeling and CD34 selection. However, for monkeys, these were still good cell doses, as I'll show you in the next few slides. Um, we were able to efficiently transduce these cells, so now, again, you're looking at cells that are positive for green fluorescent protein in the liquid culture and colony-forming assays. Um, you can see that the percent of cells, in this case, in the left, um, ranged from anywhere between about 18% for the second monkey to about 28% um, in the first monkey on day 11. Um, in terms of their colony-forming cells, we saw levels of gene transfer um, that were typically between about 30 and 35 percent of the colony forming cells. So the important point here was that these cells went into both monkeys and successfully reconstituted their blood without infectious complications. So we not only got the monkeys through the transplant piece, but I highlighted here on the right the number of days after irradiation that it took for their neutrophil count. Um, in the left column and their platelet count in the right column to reach what we would consider um, labels, uh, levels that were indicative of clinical stability. Um, and these timelines are actually pretty short comparatively to a standard monkey transplant. So it could be that we've actually uh, given the engraftment potential a little bit of a boost, but we would need more animals to thoroughly evaluate that. So what did the number of gene-modified cells look like in these animals? So I'll highlight um, the first animal on the left, second animal on the right. Um, I'm showing the platelet counts here in black and the uh, neutrophil counts here in white. The orange line is um, a drug called tacrolimus. Uh, it's an immunosuppressant that we give because monkey cells don't typically express green fluorescent protein, and so we don't want their immune system to reject the gene-modified cells. Um, the solid green boxes are GFP-positive neutrophils or granulocytes, and then importantly for HIV approaches, the open green boxes are GFP-positive lymphocytes or T-cells and B-cells. And so you can see that we're able to detect levels of gene-modified blood cells in these monkeys for up to a year after their transplant, higher in the second animal than in the first, but at stable levels. Importantly, for gene therapy directed towards HIV, what does the T-cell engraftment look like? And very specifically, what does the gene-modified T-cell engraftment look like? And you can see that we get uh, B-cell production pretty early after transplant in both animals. T-cell production really starts to kick into gear at about day 100 and starts increasing pretty dramatically thereafter. We see stable T-cell engraftment out to a year after transplant, which is the follow-up time currently in these particular animals. So one of the advantages that I haven't uh, included yet was that all of these processes were actually done in 30 hours or less, not in the standard two and a half to four days that we currently use for um, gene-modified cell manufacture in our current clinical trials. And this is important for scalability reasons. If you can cut down the amount of time that it takes to produce these products, you can manufacture more of them in, a, in the same amount of time. Um, so in summary, uh, we were able to demonstrate that proof of concept that we can, in fact, produce gene-modified cells that are safe for infusion, and specifically blood stem cells, um, in a portable benchtop platform. Um, this requires minimal equipment, the device, uh, which actually comes with something called a tubing sealer. We used a biosafety cabinet to prepare some reagents and to prepare the blood product to attach it to the system. Um, and other than that, um, we did not use any other equipment. Um, there were multiple types of starting blood products. I showed you apheresis products from mobilized donors. I showed you bone marrow um, from non-manipulated donors. And then I also showed you in the monkeys a uh, growth factor mobilized bone marrow product. I was able to demonstrate that we could get sufficient numbers of CD34 positive cells enriched using this system. Um, 
we certainly could improve, especially in the bone marrow and in the monkey enrichment processes, but for apheresis, we're within the clinical range that's currently used. We also got efficient gene transfer in 12 to 14 hours, so that the time frame in total was 30 hours or less, but the time frame where the cells were exposed to the reagents that actually transfer the therapeutic genes was only 12 to 14 hours in each of these processes, so basically overnight. We were able to show that these products were not only safe for infusion, but safe for infusion into hosts who are immunocompromised. What are we thinking about doing next? Well, obviously, we still have a few more things to optimize. Um, we're looking to distribute these programs because we need especially centers who are not experienced in gene therapy to validate that these protocols uh, can standardize the manufacturing. And specifically, we'd like to do that as a proof of concept in HIV gene therapy, but we're open to gene therapy in other diseases as well. So uh, when I was asked to give this um, lecture to the Community Action Board, um, I was asked to include a community summary. So a lot of what I just showed you, what does it actually mean uh, for the community? Well, this is what I would like to believe is the first tangible step towards global availability of ex vivo gene-modified blood cell therapy with a technology that's currently available, commercially available. Um, and I think that that's a huge step. Uh, it's not the only step that needs to happen. Current gene therapy trials are primarily using retroviruses to transfer the therapeutic genes. Um, retroviruses um, are successful clinically but are difficult to manufacture, and so they will be a significant bottleneck in the scale up of this particular approach. So should you be excited about this data? Yes. Um, but, you know, keeping in mind that there are more bottlenecks that will be identified as this type of therapy gets distributed out. Um, and as we treat more patients, we learn more about the current caveats to these types of approaches and further um, things that we need to highlight as potential points of refinement in the future. So with that, I uh, would like to acknowledge my laboratory uh, shown here in the picture. I especially need to acknowledge Dr. Hans-Peter Kiem, again, one of the, the co uh, leaders of the collaboratory for um, providing me with a lot of um, support for this particular research. All of this research uh, was funded by my uh, first year startup funds from the Fred Hutch as a new faculty member. Um, I also need to thank Tim Waters from Miltendi Biotech who um, collaborated with me in the development of this device beyond its current capability. Uh, Shelly Heinfeld's group at Fred Hutch provides us with the mobilized apheresis products. Um, and all of the people listed on the left under Hans-Peter Kiem's name facilitated these studies either in the treatment of uh, mice or monkeys in the interpretation of data or in the analysis of these cell products that came off of the device. Um, and I also need to thank the cell processing facility, who's not shown here uh, at Fred Hutch. Oh, actually, they are, sorry, under Shelley Heimfeld's name, uh, because that's where the device currently sits in the outer lab. Um, we now have a second device in my lab that we're continuing to build on. Um, so I hope that there are lots of questions out there, because I'm excited to answer them. Thank you for that. That's great information, lots to be excited about, lots of possibility. Can you talk for a moment about the sort of personnel side of this? Like, what kinds of training would folks need out in the field to be able to use this technology sort of in real world settings? Right, so we, we tried to build this. If, um, anyone who's familiar with the process of apheresis that patients go through in the clinic knows that um, the system setups are pretty similar in terms of loading a tubing set onto a device and understanding sort of the flow of operations and how things work. Um, and those are run by nurses. They're not, not every nurse, but specially trained nurses on those particular units. So we tried to build a system that already had a demonstrated infrastructure for training. So I do think, you know, it's not as if um, you, Eric, would be able to walk in off the street and hit go and it would all happen for you. Sure. Um, but we think that it won't require as highly sophisticated training as current GMP grade manufacturer would, re would require in the clinic. Um, it also means that fewer people need to be present. So currently, during uh, gene transfer processes in clinical trials, it's at minimum a two-person team, um, usually a three-person team. So you have two people who are actually in the clean room doing things to the cells, 
one who's doing, one who's verifying exactly what's being done. And then you have one person on the outside that's helping facilitate anything that needs to go in or out uh, of the room that they can't, because once they're in the room, they, they can't easily come out and get back in without going through a pretty big rigmarole. So we've reduced the number of staff required uh, for that part of the process as well. Thank you. Uh, so let's open it up for questions. Probably the most efficient way would be if you type your question into the chat box and we can um, then read them out and, and have Dr. Dare answer them. From there, that's probably the easiest. So, if you have a question, I have a question. Um, Our studio audience. Yes. Can you introduce uh, yourself? Yes, I, I'm Michael. I'm the CAB coordinator for Defeat HIV, and I just wanted to know. You were talking about doing this somewhere where they don't have any experience with gene therapy. Do you have any sites in mind, or do you have any areas that you're looking at? Um, and I was thinking, first of all, nationally, but then I was thinking beyond that. Uh, internationally. Yeah. So um, we sort of focused our attention initially on national um, collaborations. Um, we have a, a few candidate sites that have um, expressed some interest. Um, the big thing is getting them devices, getting them the programs at this point, um, and then sort of deciding exactly whether they want to use the same vectors that we used or if they actually want to expand it to different uh, vectors that are currently being used in other clinical trials. Um, so that is in process. We haven't officially stepped forward in that. I think we'd like to do that first um, before we distribute globally. Um, obviously, the, the, the Red Hutch has a presence now in, in Africa that could potentially be utilized, um, which is one of the possibilities, but, but there are numerous. There's also a, a company in Australia that is um, working on HIV gene therapy in particular um, that would be another potential site. So, and, so Jen, uh, I'm Tom Andrus, uh, the DHIV program manager. I'm, I'm curious because this question has come up um, in many of our community events, you know, how scalable is gene therapy really? Um, what was your experience like collaborating with the company to actually, um, you know, collaboratively develop something that really may be scalable? Um, I mean, my experience with uh, Miltenu was great. You know, we sort of had a discussion actually many years ago before this device was released um, where I was trying to mindfully piece together all of the components that would constitute the black box as multiple pieces of equipment connected in sequence. And it wasn't going very well. Um, and they had commented that they had this idea for the second generation device at the time that could in theory do all of these things. And it was built off the first generation device engineering. So they you know, readily accepted um, some of my input in terms of things that that device should include. But then when the device you know, was available and didn't necessarily meet all of the criteria, we um, were able to uh, pretty easily craft the custom software and to make some of the changes that we needed uh, in collaboration with the company to get this where it needed to be. Um, so in terms of that, um, I think it was, you know, pretty easy. Um, in terms of the scalability, I think um, probably the first thing that will happen is that many currently existing gene P facilities that do modified gene stem cell or, gene, or T cell uh, manufacture will have the capability of purchasing several devices to run at the same time um, to scale up the number of patients that could be treated by any one facility or manufactured by any one facility at a given time. So we have a couple questions that have come in through chat. Uh, the first one, it looks like the number and percent of gene modified cells is reduced between day five and day 11. Does that trend continue? Does it not matter that that number goes down as the remaining cells will continue to engraft and grow? Do we have any idea how much engraftment will be needed for it to be clinically significant? <laughs> so um, the trends that we see with the decline between days five and 11, we see in every cell product that we ever gene modify. Um, so it was actually good for us to see that trend because it meant that they were performing at least as well, if not in the same fashion, um, as cells in our current clinical trials. Um, it does matter how much the number goes down, but we still, despite the number of patients for many different diseases that have been treated with gene therapy, we don't necessarily understand what the exact number needs to be in that in vitro test for it to amount to something that's clinically significant in vivo. 
it seems like, uh, you know, some type of conditioning probably plays a big role in all of the patients treated um, in the studies that have been conducted where no conditioning was used. Uh, we don't see um, success in the therapeutic levels of gene-modified cell engraftment. Um, whether or not, so you, you might remember too, um, let's see, for the apheresis products that between donors one and two, there was a pretty big range with donor two having the higher numbers in that day five and 11 trends on the left graph, but on the right, they actually had a slightly lower number of colony forming cells that were gene modified, um, which is another thing that, um, you know, we think plays a role but doesn't necessarily always amount to what we'll see in vivo. Um, it has been estimated by a couple of other groups um, that we would need at least 10% of the T cells in an individual HIV resistant to get a therapeutic benefit. Um, but that has not been rigor rigorously clinically validated. Um, but there are several, there's a, especially uh, one publication in particular documenting that mathematical modeling suggests you would need 10% of the T cells gene modified for HIV in particular to have a therapeutic benefit. And I, uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, so when we think about this kind of box, how much would it actually cost for that kind of box? And then how are the requirements about storage, temperature, storage requirements, portability, can I put it in my backpack and carry it to the next town or something <laughs> like that? Um, so the box itself currently costs about $150,000 uh, for one box. Um, obviously, there's a lot more cost associated with the manufacture of each um, component. Currently, um, for any blood stem cell gene transfer approach that uses retroviral vectors, the cost per patient has been um, estimated to be on average about $38,000 in a standard GMP infrastructure for just one patient product. Uh, we were able to reduce that to about $26,000 per patient for the products that we manufactured on our device. Um, a lot of that comes into play with the reduced time and personnel uh, that I mentioned. Unfortunately, the reagent you use to select the stem cells and the growth factors you need to make those cells happy while you're culturing them for gene transfer don't change, and those are some of the most expensive pieces in this process. Uh, the most critical cost, again, as I mentioned at the end, is in the retroviral vector production that's used for these types of approaches. Um, and so that will be another bottleneck that will have to be overcome for this to really meet the scale requirements. Uh, in terms of the portability, the device can be moved. Um, that's not a problem, and the individual tubing set components are disposable. Um, so what we envision really is a kit um, that comes with the different components that are just kept at the temperature they need to be kept at. They're pulled out when you get a patient who comes in, so you get a, a blood cell product. Um, you would pull out the components, you would put them on the device. 30 hours later, you would have your gene-modified cell product for the patient that could either um, go in directly or could be cryopreserved for shipment. Uh, elsewhere to where it needed to be. Thank you. Uh, how long until this would be ready for sick people? So um, we are in the process of trying to get um, FDA approval to use this device for a couple of different uh, disease approaches. Um, not HIV quite yet. Wherever there's a current gene therapy um, clinical trial in process, the onus is on us to demonstrate that our in a box process works as good if not better than um, from the FDA perspective. So we're trying to generate a lot of different data sets right now to show that. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to get FDA approval for the use of this device. And then it's gonna take a standard probably phase one, phase two uh, clinical trial set up um, to get FDA approval for this to hit sick people in all parts of the country and or the world. Thank you. So we have a couple members of the Defeat HIV Cab in the room with us also, and there's a couple questions, so we'll go to them and then back to the chat box. Bill? I wanted to ask about the $150,000 cost. Is that total for the whole treatment, or is that for each treatment? Or so, how many treatments would you need? So that is, right now, the cost for a single patient to get one treatment. We would hope that what we can build is a therapy that only requires a single treatment. But even if you needed two or three, you're still at 450000 compared to the $600,000 lifetime cost of treatment um, for HIV-positive patients. But for each disease that we'd like to treat, 
with gene therapy, that same analysis needs to be done. And that $150,000 includes your, your clinical care for your growth factor shots, for your aphrase that's processed to be collected, for drugs that may be administered, for your conditioning, and then your monitoring, clinical monitoring after that conditioning, as well as the infusion of those cells and the manufacture of those cells, and any follow-up that would be required to assess that you made it through the treatment regimen successfully. Thank you. Um, what are some threats to uh, kind of the the period where we are monitoring the people who have gone through these trials? Like, are there any like opportunistic infection threats that are like viable uh, like threats to making all of the trials shut down? Um, I mean, certainly, gene therapy has had its ups and downs. Um, you know, the very first gene therapy trials, most notable in um, patients with immune deficiency, inherited immune deficiency, um, where we were using different types of retroviral vectors, developed leukemia as a result um, of the gene transfer into their blood stem cells. However, um, it was about 20% of all of the patients treated in those trials, and there was still a definite therapeutic benefit that they all received um, that outweighed uh, the risk. That said, the field definitely wants to move towards safer modes of gene therapy. Um, we did this with lentiviral vectors because that's currently what's used most clinically um, in these types of stem cell gene modification trials for all of the different diseases that I showed. Um, we're definitely trying to move more into even better modes of gene transfer, including specific gene editing. Um, in terms of infectious potential, um, most, not all, but a few gene therapy trials have noted that some patients couldn't receive their gene modified cells because the cell product got compromised in some way during that manufacture using the standard process. Um, it's a very, very small number. Um, so the infectious risk from the, the gene modified cell product I think could be pretty low. Um, the potential is always if you have to give conditioning to a patient to get those cells then to engraft, obviously the patient is going to be at an increased risk for infection during the period of time after those cells have gone in but where blood cell counts have not right, quite recovered to where they need to be. Thank you. So back to the chat. Uh, you mentioned that gene, mo uh, gene modified cells to be chem chemotherapy resistant. Does that present a downstream risk of producing cells that will be chemo-resistant in the case of future malignancy? So certainly, as I just mentioned, there have been gene therapy trial patients who had um, uh, malignancy that resulted from the gene transfer. In this case, um, if the, the, the viral vector that we're using in this particular study has not generated a case of malignancy as a result of the gene transfer, um, however, if that were to occur, it's one specific family of chemotherapy agents that these cells are resistant to, and that's DNA alkylating agents. There are multiple other classes of chemotherapy agents that could be used to treat a malignancy if it arose from a gene-modified cell. Thank you. Uh, and is it feasible to treat people with the conditioning regimen in a low-income country medical setting? So I think that if, in the case of mild conditioning, um, this is something that would definitely be feasible because it there's basically clinical care established um, that is pretty supportive for patients in those sort of low levels of blood cells but not completely wiped out blood cell settings. Um, if it has to be fully loaded conditioning, which I don't think will be the case for all treat diseases that are targets for gene therapy, but possibly for some, um, then we're probably going to need a little bit more of a sophisticated medical center setup, but not the level that we currently need for gene therapy clinical trials. Any other questions in the room? One of the things that I've been wondering, and I don't know if it's an appropriate question for this webinar, but when we talk about Timothy Ray Brown being the only one that's been cured, uh, and several attempts have been made since then that have failed, have they been able to identify what it was about Timothy Ray Brown that made this treatment work? So that's a difficult question. I'm certainly not the, the expert uh, in that particular area. But at the same time, I think just generally sort of the three components that I discussed, people think 
could have rationally contributed to his results, but we really don't understand whether it was one, two, or all of them that facilitated his outcome. Um, and that's where we're trying to use the science and the gene transfer trials to really get at some of those questions, um, but we haven't had a, a second clinical experience yet that has brought us the same, to the same outcome that we could learn from. Any other questions? Yes. So, Jen, this is uh, Tom again. Um, I know a recurring theme of questions is, uh, by the community is around cost. Um, do you anticipate that the cost um, expenses that you mentioned, are those, would those be necessarily out-of-pocket expenses, or is there any chance that you know, someone's health insurance coverage, whether now or at some point in the future, should this be scalable and be safe and effective therapies, could potentially cover some of these uh, costs? So I think that definitely we're moving towards this being included as part of a, a standard treatment regimen. Um, it's not there yet, um, but I think that it would be something that if we can show clinically viable um, therapeutic benefit, it'll be covered by insurance in the future. I definitely think uh, much more of the community believes that that's a possibility because there are many commercial entities that are now buying into gene therapy. Um, and I don't uh, necessarily think they're anticipating for this to be entirely picked up by patient out-of-pocket expense. One more question just came in. So what is the typical percentage of success for patients treated with mild conditioning? And would that also preclude them from receiving a transplant to treat, treat their HIV? Um, so we haven't treated enough patients in the HIV gene therapy trials to um, assess whether or not there's success with mild conditioning or not. Um, in other disease settings, it's very specific to the disease population that's being treated whether or not mild conditioning works. Um, certainly in the immunodeficiencies where you already have an advantage because there is no immune system without the gene modified cells present, uh, with mild conditioning there's a really great success rate, whereas in sickle cell disease, um, you know, you need a pretty hefty conditioning dose to get engraftment, but there's no space for those cells to go without any conditioning being present. Uh, the same could be true for the thalassemia. So um, I think that we're starting to figure out that there is a disease-specific component to how much conditioning would be required, and then whether or not that precludes them from receiving a transplant later. Um, it shouldn't if we're talking about a donor transplant. Um, Myeloablative conditioning regimens come in a couple of different flavors, and um, we, we can't yet predict what the potential, you know, um, side effects would be. Of course, um, we would expect with standard clinical regimens the usual suspects in terms of side effects, but any one of these investigative treatments has the potential to change those outcomes, and we can't predict what they are until we start treating patients. So it sounds like you still have some work to do in your lab, but lots of excitement. So thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to remind folks that we have uh, various presences on the web. So visit our website, defeathiv.org. Uh, this will be posted at some point soon, so you can check it out. Um, there's also many other ways to get to us if you have further questions, we can figure out ways to find answers for you. Uh, so again, uh, thank you very much and have a le great day. Rusé, que le diable ait jamais réussi, ça a été de faire croire à tout le monde qu'il n'existait pas.